Mali installs a new government in the wake of a grisly terror attack. Will a new prime minister be able to stop the bloodshed? I'm Imran Garda and today's newsmaker is Mali's changing leadership. Bubu Sisse is a politician without a party. And as the newly picked prime minister, he has the unenviable task of working with all sides of government to turn Mali's worsening security situation around. He takes office following the killings of 160 Fulani herdsmen in the town of Ogosagu, an attack that led to the resignation of the last prime minister just days ago. And Sise will not have time to get comfortable in his new position. He'll not only have to stop vigilantes from massacring farmers, He's also got to reignite the public's confidence that the government can do its job. People in Mali seem fed up with the violence that's plagued the nation since ethnic Tuaregs took over half the country in 2012, forcing the French to intervene. And now questions remain on whether Sisse will be able to do what his predecessors could not and bring peace. Natalie Pohanan reports. It's all quiet now in this village in central Mali. But in March, it was a scene of carnage. More than 150 people from the ethnic Fulani community were massacred. Members of a militia from a rival group are suspected of being responsible. Mali's president, Ibrahim Boubacar Keita, sacked two generals after the attack. En cas d'alerte, je ne peux pas tout trouver, je ne trouverai plus que le mettre une à deux heures avant de sur le lieu. Les équipes doivent être en permanence mobilisées. Nous ne sommes pas en temps de paix. Nous sommes en temps de guerre. But those words were not enough for Malians. They've been airing their frustrations with the government angry at its inability to protect civilians, rein in militias, and to address the deteriorating security situation. Everyone knows that Mali is going through a multi-dimensional crisis. We have witnessed killings on a scale never seen before in this country's history, in its entire history. Since the election of President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita, his re-election, so-called re-election, the country is going from bad to worse. Nearly four weeks after the massacre, the Prime Minister and his government resigned. President Keita has named Bubu Sisse, a former finance minister, as his new premier. Sisse has been tasked with not only uniting the country, but also improving security. It's a daunting responsibility. In 2013, French-led forces began a military operation to push out Al-Qaeda-linked militants from northern Mali. Shortly afterwards, the UN launched a peacekeeping mission that's still ongoing. It's the world's most dangerous country for peacekeepers. Militants are still active in pockets of the nation and in neighboring countries in the Sahel. They've been able to build on long-standing ethnic rivalries to stoke violence. In 2015, the government and some rebel groups signed a peace agreement. It was meant to end fighting, particularly in the northern and central regions. It hasn't. The attack in March was the country's worst incident of intercommunal violence in years. From that starting point, the new government will have to try to build peace once again. Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Well, to discuss this, let's go to our panel. In Paris, Louis Kumayu is president of the African Information Club and Dogukolo Bakonari is president of the Kisal Observatory, a human rights group focusing on the Sahel region. Gentlemen, it's a pleasure having you on The Newsmakers. Dogukolo Bakonari, let me start with you. Is a new prime minister the solution for... Mali's problems? I'm not sure there's a definite solution to the problem at hand because uh, we have tried so many different combinations of prime ministers and governments. It seems to me that the general context of Mali battling the jihadists and also having to face uh, difficult intercommunal relations is something that really requires political will. 
this new prime minister was a member of the government that just um, finished their duty last week. And I'm really wondering about the commitment and the political will to pursue any major shift in policy. Right, so Louis, the fact that Bubu Sisse was a part of the government, the former fi finance minister, does it suggest that it will be more of the same and this might just be mm. a, cosmet a cosmetic change, Louis? No, I think it's a change. The people were looking, were looking for a change. Uh, the fact is, when you consider the position in France, for example, Emmanuel Macron was part of the government of uh, uh, François Hollande before becoming candidate and now president of France. It has been a change, maybe not the change people people were looking for, but it's the first step to the change people people are looking for, and the partners too. So I think what is deeply deeply concerned here is not only the fact we have the right man at the right place, is the right answer to the right problem. And I don't think just changing the prime minister will bring a huge solution to the huge problems Mali is facing now. Because it's not only a problem with the opposition, it's not only a problem with the partners who are looking for the, the application of the agreements mm -hmm. signed in Algeria. It's also a problem with the majority, with the party of the president, who has been also willing a change of prime minister. So we have lots of problems, but few solutions only now. Okay, Dugokolo, did it take for something as grotesque as the Ogosagu massacre for the Malian leadership to finally realize that there's a big problem because things were bubbling on and off, up and down for about eight years. Did it take something so horrendous for them to finally have some self-awareness that they needed to do something? Well, contrarily to what most of the media is saying, I don't agree with the statement that Ogosagu and the massacre is what uh, prompted the president to want to change uh, prime minister and what prompted the prime minister to resign. I think that this is uh, one event in a series of very unfortunate events. Uh, there are also problems within the army and it's been bubbling up for months. And even the situation of human rights, this is something that an organization like mine, like Kisal, has been trying to advocate for for years. But there was no one to listen. Even when they were listening, in reality, uh, they weren't able to enact any major change on the field. Now, my major concern is that this is going to be some sort of public relations operation and saying, well, we're cleaning up the face and we're trying to sail toward a new direction. And I'm not sure that uh, there is a definite plan yet. Hmm. Dogokolo, was it a failure of the former prime minister or is he just being scapegoated and they're pinning the blame on him and his cabinet? so that they don't have to deal with accountability for bad decisions and the inability to keep Mali insecure. And there's a lot to say about the prime minister, probably uh, many positive things that he did and also, uh, unfortunately, uh, lots of misdeeds. Uh, and to check the balance now will be pretty um, short-sighted because we need to take a step back and look at the context in general. Right. Um, I'm not sure that changing the prime minister now um, was due to the fact that the, uh, the, the, the prime minister who just left was lacking in competence and skills. I think that there was some pressure from the civil society, from religious leaders, and facing that sort of crisis, um, the prime minister or the president decided that it was better to sort of pacify um, the society at large and this is the reason why he left. Right, so and pressure. Louis, right, and, and Louis, given I'd the say. fact that Sisei is an ethnic Fulani, how important is that? Help me understand that. Certain people will feel themselves uh, represented by him uh, as prime minister, but I think it is not the only issue here, because the big issue is to recognize that Mali is a country who is not a normal country. They are facing big difficulties now because of jihadism, because of economic crisis, because of political crisis, and bringing only one solution, the political solution, is not the answer to the huge problems uh, the country is, failing, uh, is facing now. So I think it's probably a good position as political answer, but it is nothing 
concerning the the, the entire problems uh, problem uh, Mali is facing now, and I don't know, maybe they will find a solution to bring to bring uh, answers to the social issues uh, people are looking for answers right. to, and also to satisfy the partners, France, mm -hmm. first of all, the countries who are in the G5 Sahel, and all the partners who are, who are helping uh, Mali to face its difficult problems, its, uh, the lot of problems is facing now. So I'm a little point, in, I'm in a little bit uh, disappointed with the fact that there is only a political answer to a problem which is very huge right. now, and who needs the help of all the political uh, elite of the country. And bringing only an ethnic pro solution to a problem they consider as ethnic is not a national answer to, to the problem. Dogo Carlo, are they looking at it purely through an ethnic lens and they should be looking at it through a broader lens maybe? Please. Well, I want to go back to the notion that the prime minister was chosen because of his ethnicity. I don't believe that this was uh, an element that factored into the decision of the president to pick him as prime minister. I think that he just happens to be an ethnic Fulani. And probably there are going to be some benefits ripped from that fact. And the current ethnic strife that is prevailing in Mali isn't really something that will last long in the future if uh, the necessary measures are decided now. The problem is that people have been antagonistic for a couple of years because of the presence of jihadists, because of past grievances. And when you don't have any state presence, you don't have security, you don't have justice, of course, it's going to boil and then it's going to overcome any efforts if they're not uh, definitive. About the G5 Sahel force, we have been talking about it for years now and it's not operational. So it's not capable to stand between uh, fighting parties to do interposition or to chase uh, terrorists uh, either. And I believe that combining uh, the help from the international community and their ability to really sustain a war on the long term will bring some sort of social security in Mali that should allow Malian leaders to feel at ease when deciding policy um, to better rule the country. But they seem to be back against the wall now. Uh, that's the only explanation that, that I have because there have been so many prime ministers and the government has tried to shift, but the basis didn't really change. So I'm wondering, is this some sort of uh, admission of, of failure and right. inability to find creative solutions? Right. Louis, the enemy doesn't quite have a, an exact geography. They don't have an address. And so besides when we see Ogosagu, we see soldiers being killed, 11 recently, a UN peacekeeper was killed. So with all of that in mind, people, you know, people getting blown up by landmines and stuff, and you don't know which group's doing it and where the, exactly they live and where they come from. How does changing the cabinet solve any of that? I don't think the change of the cabinet will help. I don't think also the military solution will be the, the ending solution, will be the high point in resolving the, the issue. The problem is since the, the economic crisis uh, started in Mali, since the political uh, issue also had different changes, we had a generation of leaders in which uh, the people were believing uh, they've been from Alpha Omar Konare to Alpha Amadou Toumani Touré, and now Ibrahim Boubacar Keita. People were hoping to have a change with them, and there is no change. The situation is becoming worse. So I don't think the only solution we'll bring will be to change leaders or to bring military solutions. Those two solutions don't work alone. And even if we combine them, I'm not sure it will work. So we need to work with uh, political leaders who are work, working hand on hand to find definitive solutions to the problems, not having political leaders who are dividing on all the issues in which we are looking, we are seeking uh, global solution, global uh, answers coming from the leaders on the political scene. So I don't know, I'm, I'm, I have a doubt concerning the fact that changing the prime minister will bring the solution. Dogokolo Bakunari, President Bubakar Keita.
Does he know what he's doing? Well, I, I, again, I want to go back to the question you just asked and one thing that was said. I, from where I stand, as someone from um, a human rights organization, I think the, 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 the matter that really, uh, the element that was lacking um, with the government is that they didn't rely enough on the civil society. Mm. Several times I have spoken with officials. Um, I have met officials from different levels, sometimes really high in the hierarchy. And I have always told them that we have a way to do early warning and to be able to work with the military and say where danger is happening. And this is something that could be really useful if they were able to seize the opportunity. But if it's just um, uh, a top-down approach to the problem solving, this is going to really take a long time. And about the president, I think there was a time when it was difficult to 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 allege that the president knew for sure what was happening in the country, uh, that cannot be said anymore. Uh, the president has traveled to Ogosago. He has met um, leaders of opinion. He has met foreign officials. So he knows what is happening. Um, the problem is not a question of ignorance now. Mm -hmm. The question is really a question of whether the president is willing and able to enact a ma major sh change and shift in the way that uh, several actors of Mali right. work together within the government and between the government and other institutions and the civil society. Yeah, Dogokolo, how partial are you to the argument that some make that Mali is a victim of its geography, that after the Libyan revolution started, all these weapons, of course, flooded across the border, these jihadist groups, as you say, you know, crossed the border, started causing havoc, it's not only a problem that Mali has, Burkina Faso has it as well. And unfortunately, a terrible sequence of events started and it's very mm. difficult for the central government to keep this country together and keep everybody safe because it was a problem that was out of their hands. Are you partial to that argument? Mm. It's very complex. Certainly, we can blame um, the fall of Gaddafi for every single thing that's happened. Even before that, in the early 2000s, jihadist groups were present in the north of Mali and the government wasn't able to uh, really repel them. And then there was an agreement in Algiers in 2006 between the Malian government and some Tuareg rebels in which they, they, they had to concede um, military patrols in some areas of the north. So the state in terms of governance was already uh, taking a step back. The geography of Mali is not extraordinary. I mean, the country existed for several decades now, and at times uh, that wasn't a factor that hurt Mali. Uh, we have to take a, a broader look um, into African integration, into the way that our supranational organizations work. Uh, the ECOWAS, which is the Economic uh, Committee of West African countries, should have been able to have mechanisms of prevention and defense. Nowadays, uh, countries don't fight between themselves. They have to fight uh, asymmetrical wars. So it doesn't make sense that they will all collaborate to strengthen their borders. It's, not, it's certainly not a problem of Mali itself alone. And you can see that Burkina Faso and Niger, Niger are, are impacted as well. That's one of the reasons why G5 Sahel was proposed as a solution. But again, um, the solution isn't going to be satisfactory as long as it's not something that integrates other countries of the area and there's not a decisive plan um, decided together. Louis, has ECOWAS failed Mali so far? No, and first of all, uh, to recall your, your question, the fact is Mali is not a neighbor of Libya. Mali is neighboring Algeria. So they don't have a common border with Libya. But uh, the fact that Libya was in that situation has helped those rebels, those jihadists, to have some some weapons they didn't have before. They have they have received more weapons than they had before, and that is why it changed the game. And uh, yes, Mali cannot alone face all those problems. And the fact is that uh, ECOWAS has not failed, but ECOWAS does not have the means to fight those enemies who are really richer than ECOWAS, than all the countries of ECOWAS united. So it is a matter of means now. And I think 
the, the partners will help, the ECOWAS, the partners coming from abroad also will help, but that will, that will never be enough if we don't have administration that will be helping populations close to their location. And now, concerning the north of Mali, uh, the state has failed. There is no administrator. There is no public administration close to the population. So everything is going wrong, and that's why it is mm -hmm. very impossible, in, from my point of view, to end this war and to end this situation at the north of Mali. Okay. Gentlemen, I thank you both uh, for joining us from Paris. Louis Kumayo and Dogukolo Ba Konarig. Looking forward thank to you having you back on the show soon. Still to come on the newsmakers, as Algeria enters its 10th week of unrest, we talk to a member of the opposition about why he's boycotting the upcoming elections. And after a year of mass protests in Nicaragua, we discuss how President Daniel Ortega has managed to keep the country's top job. Algerian police have arrested five businessmen as part of a military crackdown on corruption aimed at the country's ruling elite. The country's former prime minister and current finance minister are also under investigation. It follows nine weeks of anti-government protests and the resignation of longtime president Abdelaziz Bouteflika. Algerians are set to vote for a new leader in July, but opposition parties have vowed to boycott the election until a new political system is put into place. Well, joining me now to discuss this is Abbas Arwa. He's a human rights activist and co-founder of Rashad, a political movement aimed at non-violent resistance against the Algerian government. Good to have you on the program, sir. Thank you very much for your invitation. You agree with the boycott? Of what? Of elections until the system is changed? The people is uh, agreeing. Mm -hmm. uh, but would you support that? that? Of, of course. Yeah, tell me why. Not, not uh, because we are against the principle of election. Mm. The Algerian people... Uh, is outside because uh, he wants to recover his uh, uh, will, mm -hmm. uh, political will, and have a say in, in, uh, in, in their future and in, in uh, choosing and electing their representatives and uh, their rulers. Mm -hmm. So the problem is not the principle of election. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, universal suffrage must be the only way to choose uh, people. The problem is, uh, do we have the uh, prerequisites, mm -hmm. the conditions, to have free and fair elections. Aren't they creating the conditions? You're seeing no. not only Bouteflika, now you're seeing all these businessmen and politicians, the people around him who are benefiting, are now having their moment of reckoning. So aren't they creating those preconditions? Yeah, but there is a confusion now because uh, the chief of staff, who is really uh, doing things, uh, who, who is making political decisions, mm. he said that Bouteflika and he, uh, uh, w w the, the people around him, mm -hmm. he, he qualified them as, as a gang. Mm. But he's supporting people who are part of this gang. When, when you look at the, the, the uh, former president of the, of the Senate who, who was the, uh, nominated as, as mm -hmm. president now, you, when you look at the uh, prime minister, mm -hmm. they are part of this gang. So it's, it, ha it, has, it, it has no meaning right. to, to leave these kind of people mm -hmm. uh, organizing the elections. Mm -hmm. It's nonsense. Um, you were in exile for many years. Sure. Would you go back now? Uh, no, because just I, I, I don't have a, a passport to go. I see. Yeah. But I mean, but it's, this it's, is a, it's, it's not a, perfect, but it's moving in the right direction, isn't it? Wouldn't you trust of course. the changes enough now to go back home? Of course it's moving in the right mm. direction because of the popular pressure, because people mm. are outside demonstrating peacefully in order to establish the rule of law and good governance, and mm -hmm. this is the main objective. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, the aim is not to get rid of Bouteflika mm -hmm. and leave the system as it is, as it was, at his, as it has been since 1962. Right. The aim is to modernize the state, to uh, have a civilian state, that is ruled by a civilian elite and to have a democratic control of the armed forces. Right. The Algerian protesters also have a bit of a sense of humor. They're calling for the, all the bees to, to go. 
or Ba in, in Arabic. So Bouteflika yeah. wins, and now they're saying Badawi and Bushareb and Ben Salah and so on. They, is it easy to identify who the rotten apples are, given that the whole system was something that built up power for so, so long? Is it easy to say these are bad guys, these are good guys? What is sure is that they are not bees. They are bees, but not bees. What they are producing, mm -hmm. what they have produced in Algeria is an enormous chaos, enormous, you know, uh, uh, a, a massive, you know, corruption. Uh, and that's why uh, Algeria is now a, 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 can be qualified as a rich country with poor people. Mm. I mean, this should be a condition in order to enter uh, a genuine transition. Mm -hmm. One condition is that those people who were around Bouteflika and were uh, uh, ruling the country for 20 years go away mm -hmm. and leave a new elite, credible right. people, tr trusted by the, the population to, to... But isn't that the it. point? You don't need a new elite. They don't want an elite, the people. They no, when, when a, I'm, yeah. well, an elite, that, oh, right. uh, me, a meaning, meaning a leadership right. that is uh, uh, rooted, of course, rooted right. in, in, in this uh, uh, protest, in this movement. What, what institutions would you keep and what institutions would you throw out? Given that, as an outsider, Algeria is not Libya under Gaddafi, right? Okay, it's better than a lot of other places. So what would you keep and what would you say, okay, this is rubbish, we need to throw out? We don't uh, want to uh, throw the institutions. We want to keep all the institutions. But the people are saying they want the what whole system we want, to change. What yeah. we want to change mm. are the people who are uh, leading these institutions. We want uh, the resignation of the government that was uh, designated by, by Bouteflika. We want the dissolution of the parliament mm -hmm. and the Senate. We want really uh, uh, the starting of, of a genuine transition, uh -huh. which is not controlled by the military. We want the establishment of, uh, when I say we want, th there is a consensus. There are, there are people who, are, who agree, um, the majority of pe people who represent the, 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 this movement, the movement, the, the, the demonstrations, they agree that we, it's good to, to have a collegial presidency. We want to nominate a government, uh, call it uh, uh, of national unity or, or national salvation, mm -hmm. in order to, to run the day-to-day -day affairs of the state, and to start a national inclusive consultation in order to look at things like, mm -hmm. uh, like the how, how, to, how do we do with the constitution, how we organize the elections, etc. Right. The people who would allow that process to unfold are still ultimately the army. Am I wrong? Do you trust them? Well, uh, I don't trust the military. I don't trust the capacity of the military to hand over the political power. They are, uh, they're, 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 of course, there, there are some of them who are willing to engage in, uh, in, a, in a true democratic transition. Mm -hmm. But some of them are trying, are attempting by all means to keep, to maintain their grip on the uh, political power. Some of them, a minority, uh, fortunately a minority, wants to push people, push the demonstrators into, in, in, in violence. They want to, uh, to get, get uh, rid of this uh, movement by repression mm -hmm. and they, they didn't uh, succeed, uh, fortunately. Uh, another part are, uh, of, of, the, of the military establishment are trying to, uh, to do political maneuvering in order to, to keep, to, to change the facade and to keep the nature of, of the state. But I think if there is a, a decisive and, and uh, 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 if there is, a, uh, the, 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 fa the main factor will, 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 which will determine the change is the pressure of the, oh. of the Algerian people. So at what point should the people go off the streets and go back home and trust the system? At what point? What needs to happen? When they feel that the military accepted, accepted to enter a genuine 
transition. That means they uh, answer the requests that are now in, in the streets. And I have uh, just mentioned some of them. Uh -huh. uh, to, to get rid of this uh, government, uh -huh. Uh, to, uh, uh, to, um, uh, the, 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 to have a dissolution of the parliament and, and the senate and to start a genuine uh, transition with people who are trusted by the people. Mm -hmm. Is it lazy or is it a warranted fear for some people to think that maybe Algeria might have their own version of Sisi in a year or two given how things are going? I think uh, the Algerian people uh, benefited from uh, a couple of, of experiences and took the uh, appropriate lessons. First, from their own experience in the 90s right. uh, concerning the use of violence. Now they, are, they have a sort of immunity against violence and this is a good thing and I hope uh, the protests will, will con contain and remain nonviolent and peaceful. This is because, the, uh, as I told you, the. Uh, uh, so some of the uh, uh, officers of the military institution, they try to push oh. into violence. The second thing is that they don't want a country ruled by the military. They, when, when you look at the slogans, they, they, they really are in, uh, uh, in a, a mood uh, where they uh, focus on the civilian nature of the, uh, oh. of the state. So I, I don't think that they, they, they will manage to get uh, a scenario like a like, uh, CC scenario. And another thing is that, you know, this regime has tried, has attempted to divide the, 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 the mm -hmm. street. They, they used, uh, they, they tried to play on, on ideological pro, uh, polarizations. They, they attempted to play on uh, ethnic, you know, d divides, but they didn't manage. And uh, truly, I, I, I feel that, uh, uh, that the people, the Algerian people now reach a, uh, a, a degree of maturity mm -hmm. that, that is uh, really encouraging and, and uh, uh, keeping us, uh, keeping a lot of hope that uh, mm -hmm. this unity and this engagement, this massive engagement will bring some results in the, hopefully in the coming weeks, right. not months. Seven years ago, when the Algerian government had asked France to arrest your colleague, Murad Dahina, um, who's from Rashad as well, as far as I understand. The French did it, and then the French, I guess, they didn't have any evidence to prove terrorism or links to extremism, and they had to drop it. But the French were extremely eager to help their Algerian friends at that time. The French have said a bunch of things over the past few weeks. How crucial is it, do you think, that whatever happens, this Algerian government or system has to decouple itself from the French. And is it possible to do that? What we have seen in the past uh, weeks, uh, you know, they, they tried to use the, uh, the international card. You know, they, they nominated uh, uh, Brahimi and uh, La Mamra and, uh, in order to, to campaign in order to campaign at the international level, they, they went to Russia, to Europe, to, in order to convince their counterparts to, to, to support them. But uh, I think uh, they didn't manage to get an, any support. Do you want the French to get out of your business? Of course. Yeah. No, okay, is there no, any no, way they can no help? No Algerian would right. tell you that. Uh, is there we, any way they can help in a positive way, given the history? Of, yes, it's of a history course, of colonialism they, what, and so yeah, on. We, but we, we have no problem with, right. with Algerian French relations. We, right. are, we are neighbors. We have, you know, geography and history uh, between us. So uh, we, we, are, we, we don't want uh, to, to cut our relations with France. Right. But we think that France would uh, guarantee its legitimate uh, interests with a legitimate Elite, uh, ruling elite in Algeria, not with this gang. Mm -hmm. So but you, you believe the French were behind this gang throughout? Of course they supported. Yeah. Right. They supported Bouteflika for the, for mm -hmm. the 20 years of his, of his rule. And uh, mm -hmm. I mean, not only Bouteflika. Right. They supported the military coup in 92. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the problem with the French, with some French uh, political elites, that is that they, they, they think of Algeria as, uh, still as, uh, as uh, a colony. Mm -hmm. And this has to change. 
Abbas Arwa. Last question to you. Are you optimistic? Of course, very optimistic. I think we have uh, a huge, you know, uh, challenges to overcome. Uh, that's why we are uh, we are really in a hurry to start mm. this uh, transition, you know, because we are we have to deal with the past, with the present, with the future. We have to build strong institutions. We have to deal with the economy, with all the catastrophe that we are uh, getting uh, out of this uh, rule of of the gang. So. All, all these challenges are motivation for the, for the people and for the youth to work and, and to stimulate them to work for their country. It's a pleasure having you on the Newsmakers. Thanks for joining us. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Nicaraguan President Daniel Ortega promotes himself as a man of the people. But after he pushed for social security reforms a year ago, hundreds of thousands of those people called on Ortega to resign. In fact, many believed after a mass protest broke out, his days in office were numbered. But he survived. And did he do so by listening to his opposition? No. Instead, he led a crackdown against the demonstrators, which caused tens of thousands of people to flee to neighboring countries. With more on this, here's Abu Bakr Shamahi. A year on, and Nicaraguans are still protesting against their government. About 200 demonstrators came to this rally. It's a lot smaller and more peaceful than some of the mass protests of recent months. But in the face of riots police, they're still defiant. The authorities are showing a fear that the people of Nicaragua don't have. They are the ones that are afraid. The president Daniel Ortega is so scared, making a fool of himself, as he's done these past months, thinking that this show of brute force can stop determination for freedom that the Nicaraguan people have. He's absolutely wrong. We are not scared. Rights groups say dozens were arrested at this protest, though the police deny that. But since protests against Ortega started, thousands have been arrested and more than 320 protesters have been killed. Thousands have also fled the country and the economy has taken a hit. In April last year, demonstrators took to the streets to oppose social security cuts introduced by President Ortega. The 73-year-old soon reversed his decision. But by then, protesters had another demand. They wanted him gone. Ortega was part of the Marxist Sandinista guerrillas, which overthrew the US-backed dictator Anastasio Somoza in 1979. That's when Ortega first became Nicaragua's president. He took power for a second time in 2007 and was re-elected in 2011 in a poll considered unfair by some. Critics say he's grown more corrupt and anti-democratic. But the opposition has been talking to the government in an attempt to find a solution. They want elections scheduled for 2021 to be brought forward, but Ortega has refused. A deal to release imprisoned opposition activists was agreed last month. Some have been freed. But the opposition and the government disagree on the actual number. That emphasizes the lack of trust described by the two sides. And more protests are expected. But after surviving a year of them, Ortega might be quietly confident that his rule won't be ending anytime soon. Abu Bakr al Shamahi, the Newsmakers. Well, joining me now from Durango, Colorado, is Benjamin Waddle, a, an associate professor of sociology at Fort Lewis College. And from Tucson, Arizona, is Chuck Kaufman. He's the national coordinator of the Alliance for Global Justice, an American nonprofit organization working for social change and economic justice. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us on the Newsmakers. Um, Benjamin, let me start with you. Is President Ortega as unpopular as he's ever been? 
You know, I think that's a really good question. I think Ortega was unpopular in the late 1980s as the economy was uh, tanking. Um, but I think if we look at recent moments in history, since Ortega returns in 2006, um, there hasn't been a point at which he's been um, more unpopular. He retains about 25% of his base in recent polls. Um, and that ranges between 25 and 30 percent, which is historically below the amount that he got in elections in the 1990s and in 2006, um, when you had international polls uh, following the election. So um, he wins the presidency with about 36 percent of the vote in 2006, uh, comes into power in 2007. Currently, he's hovering around 25 percent in terms of popularity. So I think it's arguable to say he's at a low point in his history of nearly four decades in power. Right. Chuck? For a lot of people, he crossed the line last year with the violent cra crackdown. Once there was blood on the streets, that was enough. Would you accept that people want to change and need a change? No, I wouldn't. Uh, he won the election in 2016 with 72.5% of the vote. Uh, recent polls show he's the fourth most popular president in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, people turned out in record numbers last July 19th uh, after the coup had been definitively defeated. And uh, I think Ortega is as popular as he ever was. Chuck, who was behind the coup in your opinion? Oh, the United States without a doubt. What sort of evidence do you have for that? The uh, National Endowment for Democracy, the U.S. Agency for International Development have poured millions of dollars into Nicaragua o over all of the years. In 2006, I took a delegation down in advance of the election and met with the International Republican Institute, and they admitted that they created the movement for Nicaragua, which was supposedly a non Non-prof, uh, non-partisan uh, NGO. We met with Ambassador Trevelli. He said he had between seven and eight million dollars to spend on the election. I think it's it's pretty clear. Okay, so let me ask you, Benjamin, when you hear what Chuck has to say, is there any value to that? That yes, the United States is pushing for change, for regime change, outside of the democratic processes of Nicaragua. Yeah, no, of course. I think what one has to take into account is the United States has spent much more in neighboring countries in recent years. 2006, the United States spends a great deal of money on the ground in Nicaragua trying to curb a wave of support towards Ortega in those particular elections. Ortega ends up winning those elections by a very slim margin, um, comes in democratically elected as president of Nicaragua after uh, nearly a decade and a half out of power. But when we look at the current situation in Nicaragua, I think it's important to keep in mind that Ortega's um, support has slipped over the years, and participation in those elections has also slipped. Record turnout in 2006, in 2011, and 2016, you see slipping numbers. Many polls have people turning out at less than 30 percent. Um, that is less than 30 percent electorate coming out in 2016. And so although Ortega wins by a large margin, um, it seems that very few people are actually engaging in those elections. Right. And so I don't know if we necessarily use that as a, you know, a measuring stick for whether or not Ortega is popular. In terms of the United States' support for movements in Nicaragua, the United States, unfortunately, since 1823, when the Monroe Doctrine was passed, which was just mentioned by the Trump administration, um, has played a heavy hand in Latin American politics. I think the question becomes, why in Nicaragua and not in other countries that have received support from NED mm -hmm. and USA? And so that I would be interested in knowing what Trump as you say. Yeah, Chuck, let me ask you about one of the promises from Ortega, promising to release more than 600 political prisoners, or what they call the remaining political prisoners, 640 political prisoners. Isn't then the obvious question then, well, why were there political prisoners in the first place? This doesn't suggest that this was the freest of places, does it? Uh, where did you get that number, 640? The Red Cross came up with 200 and some, all, uh, all but 50 of which have been released already as part of the right. the uh, negotiating process. Uh, these 
These were people who committed major crimes of arson and murder, mm -hmm. uh, burning a policeman to death. That if that if you call that political prisoner, then you you have a different definition than I do. So promising to release them then is what a sign of weakness from Ortega because clearly they're very bad people that that he's releasing. Right. Well, I mean, they're not just free to roam the streets. They're mostly released to to home. Uh, uh, incarceration, what do you call that, home detention. Um, that's been a characteristic of Ortega back into the 80s that he tries and tries for reconciliation and makes compromises that some of us mm -hmm. observing from the outside are, are just aghast right. at. Right. Uh, so. right. I, I, I want to ask you, Chuck, about some of the statistics I have from the Inter-American Commission on human rights, where they said at least 325 people were killed in the protests and the government crackdown. And there was a United Nations report in August that said that there were extrajudicial killings, arbitrary detentions, and torture. Do you reject all of that? Oh, undoubtedly some bad things happened and the the objective here should be to find the truth and punish mm -hmm. the people who who were guilty of human rights uh, 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 obstructions. But mm -hmm. it, it happened on both sides, and what the corporate media has done is completely ignore the uh, murders and arson, et cetera, on the part of the opposition. This myth of a peaceful opposition uh, is just that, a myth. Uh, to four days ago, we released a, an ebook called Live from Nicaragua Uprising or Coup, uh, which is available many places, but uh, on the Alliance for Global Justice webpage, for one, uh, which uh, provides mo much of this uh, uh, evidence that the mainstream media has ignored, including video uh, presentations. Uh, okay. So, uh, okay, so Benjamin. Is Chuck right that there's violence on the other side as well? Yeah, I know, of course. I mean, there's, I, I think one of the things that happens on April 18th of 2018 is you see a, a massive wave of people rise up against the government um, with which there had been tension against from the beginning in 2006. Ortega takes power with about 36% of the electorate voting in his favor. That means he begins his, his turn as president in 2007 as a minority um, president. He was supported by the minority of, of the nation. So he moves forward from that point um, as a president without the majority of the population support. And I think by 2017, when the economy starts to slip and um, investment patterns start to dip, it was clear that Ortega was less popular than um, the polls that he had were reporting. Um, by 2018, when people take to the streets, um, you see all kinds of different factions come out in support of a government change. And so you have peaceful factions, but you also have people that were coming out of neighborhoods that were less peaceful. Um, there was not an organized front. Uh, it was a, a movement that really came up from the streets. Students began it, um, but after it begins on the 18th and 19th of April, it takes on a life of its own. And I don't think there was any one person controlling it. And I think in many ways, that's what helps us understand why Ortega is still in power. Mm -hmm. People don't know mm -hmm. what El Dia this place or the day after would bring. And I think that's largely because there's not a candidate or a person at the, at the head of this movement, um, which makes it very difficult to know what the future would bring if Ortega were to fall. Uh, Benjamin, help me understand, as a former Sandinista rebel, help me understand the kind of emotional hold he has on so many people in Nicaragua. Well, I think if you look at the base, the 25 to 30 percent that continue to support him in polls, I think it's important to understand these are people that gave up their their lives in some cases, or at least their family members did, um, and really dedicated an important chapter of their lives, at the very least, to a movement against the dictator themselves. And so in 1979, when that triumph happens and this creation of a new country um, with new socialist and economic norms takes place, people invested a part of themselves, um, in many cases, 10, 15 years to a project. Uh, in the 1990s, there was, a, there was a conservative neoliberal government that comes into power that really made it difficult for those people that supported the Sandinista revolution to find jobs, um, to remain employed, uh, to go to, to good schools. And so by 2006, when Ortega comes back into power, 
Um, I think Tomas Borges, one of the former former commandantes who passed away in the last few years, he said, "At all, uh, the last thing we can do is give this back to the conservatives and neoliberals when they won in 2006." And I think they've held true to that. And I think the base um, has a similar position. The last thing they want to do is turn back mm-hmm. over uh, to a conservative um, opposition. And and I think you know that helps us understand the tension between the two sides. Right. And Chuck, when. Uh, there's pressure from the likes of U.S. Senator Marco Rubio and others saying that Ortega must go. What are your thoughts? Like what business is it of his? If the if the Nicaraguan people want to have a change of government, if they want to go back to neoliberalism or or even a Somoza uh, style dictatorship, well, that's the business of the Nicaraguan people. Uh, that our business is to let them make those kinds of decisions without intervention from the United States. And the intervention from the United States has been heavy handed uh, and has now interrupted you know, sustained economic growth of 5% since, since 2007. Uh, Nicaragua was the first one of the first countries to meet the UN millennial goals of, uh, of uh, cutting poverty in half by 2015. Uh, the lives of people have materially improved under Ortega, and that's why he's been reelected uh, twice since 2006. Okay, interesting to see what happens now. Still a lot of people who are angry and on the streets and feel that the anger that they had expressed a year ago has not been answered. A lot of questions. We'll keep a close eye on Nicaragua. Good to cover Nicaragua. We haven't for a long, long time on the Newsmakers. Chuck and Benjamin, thanks for joining us. That's all for this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. Check out more of our stories on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Remember to like, follow, and subscribe. Next time, we'll look at a new round of Syrian peace talks in Kazakhstan and debate the latest prisoner exchange. Until then, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.